Hi students, this presentation is going to introduce you to cell communication. In this presentation, we will focus on the question, why communicate? Here's a layout of today's discussion. First, we'll focus on what cell communication is. Then we'll look at communication in single-celled organisms, followed by a discussion of communication in multicellular organisms. So when we look at the topic, what is cell communication, we will first focus on what are the signals that cells receive, then we'll look at where do those signals come from. Then we'll ask the question, are all the signals the same? And why are correct signaling pathways under strong selective pressure? So first let's focus on what are the signals that cells receive. So cells can talk with one another, but they don't talk with sound like we can speak to another human. Cells talk to one another or talk to their environment via light, touch, and other things. Cells usually communicate with one another by chemical signals. So basically what will happen is if your neuron needs to communicate to your muscle and tell your muscle to move, your neuron will secrete a chemical known as a neurotransmitter. And that chemical will bind to a receptor on the surface of your muscle cell or a receptor that's inside of your muscle cell. So signals not only come from other cells, but they can also come from changes in the physical environment. This specific example deals with plants growing towards the sun. You've probably seen this before. If you leave a plant on a shelf, you'll notice that it grows towards the sunlight after weeks and months of growing in the same place. So there's actually a chemical in the tip of a plant shoot known as auxin. And auxin is an even, in an even distribution in the cell when um, there's an even distribution of light on the plant shoot. But when there's an uneven distribution of light on the plant shoot, auxin actually moves away from the light or towards the dark side of the shoot. Auxin stimulates cell growth, so the side that has less light will grow faster than the side that has more light. And this actually causes the cell to grow towards the sun. Almost like when you're running around a track, you'll notice that the inside part of the track is shorter than the outside part. And so if um, the side of the plant shoot that is away from the sun grows faster, that'll cause that inside part to kind of curve towards the sunlight. Pretty cool. So don't forget that when a cell is talking to another cell, they talk through chemicals. We call the cell that makes the chemical or sends the message the secreting cell. And then we call the cell that receives the signal the target cell. Not all cell signals are the same. Signals can be excitatory or inhibitory. Excitatory signals get a cell to do something or to take action. For example, an excitatory signal might cause a cell to activate a gene for making a particular protein. An inhibitory signal gets a cell to stop doing something or prevent a cell from doing something. Correct signaling pathways are under strong selective pressure because these signaling pathways enable cells to respond appropriately and efficiently to their environment and other cells. If a cell were to have a mutation in a gene that codes for a signaling pathway, that might cause the cell to not be able to respond to changes in the environment and the cell might die. Therefore, the cell would not be able to pass that mutation on to its offspring. One particular type of signaling pathway that's highly conserved with many domains of life is the toll-like receptor signaling pathway. We have that same type of receptor in mammals and in Drosophila. Drosophila are fruit flies. So not all of the proteins that are involved in the signaling pathway are the same, but they look very similar. So you'll notice these structures in this toll-like signaling pathway are very similar in both the mammal and in the Drosophila. So again, if an organism were to have a mutation in that signaling pathway, um, that organism would not be able to function as effectively and probably would not survive and reproduce as often as an organism that doesn't have that mutation. Now favorable mutations in signaling pathways can happen, they're just very rare. Now let's look at communication in single-celled organisms. In unicellular organisms, signaling pathways influence how a cell responds to its environment. Because single-celled organisms are only made of one cell, they don't need to talk within their body or between um, cells as much as we do. Because we're multicellular organisms, all of our cells need to communicate with one another. Single-celled organisms, are they're mostly going to respond to environmental signals. We'll get three types of um, communication in single-celled organisms. The first is quorum sensing, followed by mating pheromones and yeast, and then fruiting body formations and soil bacteria. 
Quorum sensing is the regulation of gene expression in response to fluctuations in cell population de density. So let's break all of that down because that sounds um, like a lot of jargon, things that are kind of difficult to understand. So we all know what regulation means. If you were to regulate the temperature in your house, you're going to probably adjust the thermostat. So regulation will involve turning on or turning off or turning up something. Gene expression just describes when a gene is turned on or off. If a gene is turned on, the protein the gene codes for is made. For example, if you activate or express the gene for insulin, then your pancreas cells are making insulin. So regulation of gene expression alters when a gene product or a protein is made or not made. And you're going to adjust that pro uh, production of protein in response to fluctuations in cell population density. That just means that based on how many other bacteria are around, the bacteria might turn on or turn off a gene. So that's what that uh, statement basically means. So this is going to work because each bacterium produces a chemical known as an autoinducer. An autoinducer is a, a chemical the that all the bacteria will be making no matter what. So when you have a lot of bacteria in a small area, you'll have a high concentration of autoinducer, but when you only have one or two, you'd have a low concentration of autoinducer. Reaching a certain threshold concentration of an autoinducer will alter gene expression. So reaching a certain threshold might activate a gene or turn a gene off. The more bacteria that are around, you're going to have a higher concentration of autoinducer, so you might activate or deactivate genes. So let's take a closer uh, look at this. This is one bacterium, and it's making autoinducer. But since it's just one bacterium, the concentration of autoinducer is very low. Therefore, that concentration is not enough to um, turn on a particular gene. However, if you have a lot of bacteria in a small area, the concentration of autoinducer will be higher, and that might reach a threshold that is then able to activate a particular gene. Let's look at a specific example in a bacterium known as Vibrio fishery. Vibrio fishery is a bacterium that lives in marine animals and it enables them to bio bioluminesce or to glow. When the population density of Vibrio fishery reaches a particular threshold, um, or basically when there's lots of Vibrio fishery in a small um, area, so there's lots of them, they'll pre be producing lots of autoinducer and that autoinducer concentration will reach a threshold and that activates a gene in the bacteria um, for a light producing protein known as green fluorescent protein. So the bacteria will only turn on the gene for producing this glowing protein when there are lots of bacteria around. You have to have a high concentration of autoinducer to activate this gene. So you might uh, ask the question, why won't the bacteria always make the, gl uh, the glowing protein? Well, when you think about it, it's not very efficient or effective for one bacterium to glow. Bacteria are pretty small, so if one bacterium is spending lots of energy to make a glowing protein, it's not actually going to have a major effect because it's so small. However, if you were to have lots of bacteria all glowing at once, then the effort would be worth it. So another example of this would be if you were at a concert, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to turn on your phone and wave your phone in the air with the light on um, when, it's, when it's dark at the concert. You're like, oh yeah, let's make it look like it twinkles and I'm like, my phone is shining, but it's not going to um, look very cool when it's just you. You're going to be wasting the effort of holding up your arm and waving your arm around with your phone. However, if everybody at the concert starts waving their phone around in the dark at the same time, then it looks um, more interesting. So the same kind of goes for this bacterium, Vibrio fishery, and quorum sensing. Another example of communication in single-celled organisms is mating pheromones in yeast. There are two types of yeast. We have A-type and alpha-type. Type A cells secrete something known as A-factor, and A-factor binds to the receptors on alpha cells. Type alpha cells secrete something known as alpha factor, and alpha factor binds to receptors on an A-type cell. Reception of a mating factor from an opposite sex leads to the production of a shape that looks kind of like a gourd or a squash, and we know, or call it a shmoo, and the shmoo will grow towards the direction from which the um, from where the other opposite sex factor came from, and this will enable the cells to find each other and fuse. So let's look at this again. Your A-type cell secretes A-factor. A-factor binds on the receptors of an alpha cell. So if an A-factor binds to an alpha receptor, that triggers the alpha cell 
to grow a shmoo in the direction from which the A factor came. And so this will help the cells to find one another and fuse. The term shmoo came from a book by Al Clapp, and so the scientist who uh, discovered the mating pheromones and yeast named it after it because the shape of the yeast looked very much like the shmoo. Finally, uh, we have fruiting body formation in soil bacteria. This is an example of collective motion in bacteria. The bacteria are able to find one another and move in unison. Under starvation conditions, or a low concentration of amino acids, your soil bacteria start to produce something known as a C signal. The C signal enables the groups of bacteria to correctly arrange themselves into fruiting bodies. So the areas that have a higher concentration of C signal will grow in a certain manner, and the areas that have a low concentration will grow in a different manner. This will trigger some of the bacteria to form the structure of the fruiting body, while other bacterial cells will form the tip of the fruiting body known as the endospore. The endospore is the place to be. The endospore cells are able to survive. Sometimes they blow off in the wind, um, but basically these are the ones that the bacteria want to be, but all of that is determined by the concentration of C signal. However, it's interesting to note that there are some mutant cheaters in bacteria that will grow into an endospore regardless of the concentration of C signal. Now let's look at communication in multicellular organisms. In multicellular organisms, signaling pathways coordinate the activities within individual cells that support the function of the organism as a whole. So we as humans are multicellular organisms made of tons and tons of cells and all of our cells need to know when to make certain proteins or not make certain proteins and how to interact in order for our whole body to function. The specific example we're going to discuss here is how epinephrine can stimulate the glycogen breakdown in mammalian liver cells. So epinephrine can cause our livers to break down glycogen into glucose. Let's see how that happens. Strong emotions such as fear and anger will cause your adrenal gland to release epinephrine into your bloodstream. So for example, if you're trying to go to bed at night and you hear somebody knock at the window, that's going to shock you or maybe kind of freak you out, and your adrenal gland will start to secrete epinephrine into your bloodstream. Well, since your blood flows all over your body, that blood, or which carries epinephrine, is going to start flowing past all of your organs, including your liver. The epinephrine can bind to a protein receptor on your liver cells and basically trigger your liver cells to do something. When the epinephrine binds to that protein receptor, the protein receptor in turn activates something else known as a G protein. And then the G protein activates an enzyme known as adenyl cyclase. When adenyl cyclase is activated, it starts to turn ATP into cyclic AMP, or CAMP for short. And then all of that CAMP made by the adenyl cyclase in turn activates another protein known as glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase breaks down glycogen into glucose. So your liver starts to secrete all of this glucose and then the mitochondria of your cells can in turn use that glucose, break it down to release ATP that you can then use to run away from the person tapping at your window or to fight the person who's tapping at your window. So this helps with your fight or flight response. So now let's visualize it. Again, when you're freaked out or shocked or something like that, epinephrine, the signaling molecule, binds to a receptor on the plasma membrane of your liver cells. When epinephrine binds to this, uh, this protein receptor, it activates the receptor, which in turn activates a G protein. The G protein will slide down, or part of it will slide down the plasma membrane and activate something known as adenyl cyclase. Activated adenyl cyclase can now synthesize CAMP, or cyclic AMP, from ATP. So uh, this adenyl cyclase turns ATP into CAMP, or CAMP. And then CAMP, in turn, activates something known as glycogen phosphorylase, another enzyme. And then that glycogen phosphorylase breaks down the glycogen into glucose. So all of your cells in your body can now get glucose um, that's been secreted by your liver. And this helps your body to get energy for the fight or flight response. So I know that's a lot, um, but I hope that's helpful. Feel free to rewind and review if you need.